someone else who wants to join. <laughs> um, this incredible bridging of fa like faunal and fantastical worlds, but thinking about the stories that we tell through geographies, through time. And that's what struck me, but we're not here to listen to me. Um, we're here to actually listen about the various tensions of storytelling, is what we decide to call um, this conversation, and do so through the lens of not only Rina, who's with us here tonight, but also that of Dr. Cleo Roberts, who is a wonderful writer, curator, um, and someone who I've collaborated with in the past and have you know, deep respect for. She focuses on South and Southeast Asian contemporary art. So it could not be more apt. Um, anyway, I defer over to them to introduce themselves, but we'll also be sharing with you some slides and taking you through all the various <laughs> angles to Rina's wonderful work. So anyway, thank you so much, Rina and um, Cleo for joining us. Mm, thank you. Um, that's, yeah, it's great to be here and also to talk about Rena's work, which I've followed for many a year, because it does something that I think is particularly important when you think about tensions and storytelling, that it has many layers and primarily masks those t tensions. I think the initial interaction with the work is one of beauty and um, intrigue, and then you get to these levels of tension. And I thought it would be worth, or when we were discussing this, we we're going to focus today around works um, which are really focused on the tension, but also involve rivers, which have been a sort of re emerging theme in Rena's work. And this piece we're seeing here is Two Degrees, and it came out of a project in Sydney called the River Project. And Rena, I was going to ask you to start off by talking about that project and what we're seeing here. Thank you, Cleo. I think, I mean, you know, there's so many different threads in the work that we could have drawn from. And I think uh, the fact that you've chosen to um, stay around rivers is, is also quite uh, relevant at this point because it's also, um, you know, I'm opening an exhibition that takes these ideas ahead, uh, which just opens on the 7th. And um, I mean, this work was in a sense a genesis for uh, the work that I'm making now. And uh, while much of the early work is about the sort of, you know, confluence and conflict, I mean, the, the sort of tensions between communities. Uh, I mean, if I might just, go back a little bit just to give you a sense of why some of those themes are you know um, of such importance in the work is because i mean you know growing up in a city like mumbai uh then bombay one was um, you know one always felt that you were in an environment that's so inclusive that you know you grew up in suburban bombay which was really rich with people from various different religious backgrounds and it almost felt a sense of like the whole every possible religion of the world is around you and and you know this experience of growing up in a city like that and with an immense sense of pride at some point uh, you began to sort of put these ideas into question when one's own experience of living in the city had changed and i'm referring now to say the 92 riots or the 2002 riots in Mumbai that we experienced firsthand. And I sort of was, you know, drawn to going back to my early childhood years where I grew up listening to stories. I mean, talking of stories. And my father, you know, while taking walks on the terrace would often tell us about his early childhood years in Lahore, which is now in Pakistan. And which was of course part of India, you know, pre-partition and um, and at that point um, you know there's there's of course an in enormous sense of silence around partition I mean most families who um, witnessed it wanted to bury the past behind and uh, which is why it's something that you you don't really read enough of in history books even and 
Uh, I mean, the way these stories are handed down, I think 70 years post uh, this most traumatic, um, you know, the world's largest human migration in human history, um, there isn't enough written about it or, or spoken about it. And I feel like time's really running out because most of those who were part of that generation are already, you know, moving on. And, um, and yeah, so, I mean, there's, there's been this sort of recurring theme within the work where I think of these communities and the fishers and these, uh, but for the river Biennial, I was thinking about the river Indus and its multiple tributaries where Ravi beads, Satlej flow into India and Jhelum, Jainab and the river Indus into Pakistan. And essentially, I mean, you know, in the 60s, uh, the partitioning of the waters took place where you know, where you have these long shared civilizational histories and this piece of course alludes to the terracottas of the Indus Valley civilization and yet the sort of split in the urns that actually carries a sound component where uh, it's essentially sounds of the river collected at various points where, you know, the river has multiple names but essentially the waters being the same and that is something that I was sort of, you know, uh, alluding to. If we look, Jen, can we flick through and there's a map of, the, yeah, yeah, that's perfect. That sort of really gives a visual on the magnitude of the river and right. its various sources and especially the areas that it runs through, which are to this day incredibly contentious, like Kashmir is, as we speak, still sort of under a massive tension, having um, Modi sort of revoked an article and uh, sort of seized it almost. Um, but can we talk about the way that also there was a treaty over this conflict and how you might sort of share water? Well, uh, I mean, you know, as we know, most rivers, I mean, uh, get manipulated through either dam projects or hydroelectric projects and often the course of the river, I mean in this case uh, it's not uh, the, the boundaries but while rivers have been the bed of civilizations they've also sort of uh, often been boundaries uh, between countries and here of course uh, you know the source of the river is in India and and which is why there's, there's always this sort of conflict over, and we know, uh, I mean, water wars would be waged over time, and, and you know, this often this crunch for natural resources. So at the heart of these uh, lie um, the problems of natural resources, whether it's land, and I often make these analogies between land, body, rivers, and veins, and, um, yeah, I mean, this, this river, as you see, runs through, like I said, Jhelum, Jainab, and the river Indus flow into India and, mm. and Ravi Beach, Satyaj. And I also know, uh, I can't profess to know huge amounts about the mythologies that revolve around this river. I know more about the sort of Ganges and the way that it's named. It has hundreds of different names. Um, is this something that you also find interesting within the work, like the myth? mythological dimensions of water? Um, well, I mean, I'm, I'm mostly thinking about our, our own relationship to water as um, not only are our bodies composed of water essentially, but also uh, the fact that water remains the origin of all life and, and these, this sort of circle of life of what we uh, carry within us internally and and our relationship to rivers as, as something that, um, um, and communities that, that live around these rivers. Um, but I think from, from that, uh, the work that you saw was that the two trees that were drawn in mm. henna bifurcate, you know, sort of again, uh, alluding to these long shared civilizational histories where, they're sort of deeply rooted and yet they sort of um, where one half grows into the banyan tree and the other into the dedar tree as these national trees of India and Pakistan and 
I think um, many of the other works that follow really are these um, are hybrids that are formed by one half coming from each side of the border. So this sort of um, this this um, need to try and bring things together, this kind of uh, tensions of mm. uh, coexistence vis-a-vis -vis conflict and and when when one is thinking of not just this sort of political divide, but I mean nature knows no boundaries. I mean you essentially have um, you know rivers and and mountains that form um, sort of mm. in the natural environment and and often these species are so native to a particular land, whereas both try to claim ownership to natural forms that don't essentially belong to either. And I think uh, for me, it was also the sort of leap of uh, moving away of distancing ourselves, not just as a human species, but one that really cohabits this planet where we know largely the disappearance of one results in the disappearance of another. And I mean, today, uh, in this moment, we, we understand our sort of interdependence um, better than ever before. I mean, we're seeing the impact of what happens in one part of the world uh, instantly uh, sort of, you know, uh, affecting every other part of the world. And if so, we, sorry. Sorry, I was gonna say, can we go to the next image, which just when you talk about cyclical and things being connected, this sort of uh, bit further on the Tondo work, Clef, which is in the, show at the moment in Aurora this work I was going to ask you exactly this this idea of the circular form mm -hmm. are you alluding here to this interconnection yeah it's almost like this sort of a globe that's formed with uh, as, as I was trying to say the, each of these species that you see are actually one halves coming from each side of borders of countries either in conflict or partitioned. So whether it's Ireland and UK having the Dion, the deer and the lion forming a cross between the two, or the Markhor and the tiger from India and Pakistan. And essentially all national symbols were meant to unite people from a region or a geography and they often become points of conflict and contestation. Like I said, when we're trying to claim ownership to these natural forms and um, here you have you know every tree bird that you see are um, conjoined uh, so you have like you know from us and cuba you have the oak palm the oak tree and the palm tree coming together or you have the crested caracara and the eagle from us and mexico forming a new hybrid so to speak so cleft really was sort of in a sense, on the one hand, you have the sort of wires that are barbed wires that I said you work with uh, electric cables that are, um, you know, meant to be transmitters of energy exchanges, communication cables, and yet here they sort of seem to morph into barbed wires or fences in the other cases, holding these kind of inherent contradictions of being both a conduit carrier and a barrier at the same time. Um, so, And do you find that with the animals, if we can get a detail shot, um, so you can sort of see the bodies more closely, I appreciate that it's a hybrid, but is there a way that we can also see this as highlighting the difference between yeah. animals? I mean, I, I, in some cases, I sort of bring them together more seamlessly, whereas in others, I sort of try to hold the violence in the image itself of, um, of this division as well as, you know, the, they sort of coming together. And I'm just thinking, really referring to these sort of zoological, botanical drawings, it's sort of form a bridge between the human and natural worlds. Mm. Because also the way that you've displayed them often um, takes from a very loaded way, like museological form of display, which is totally loaded and particularly in India with this idea of colonialism and sort of wanting to study your 
subjects and as a way of forming a body of knowledge, which if you read Foucault, knowledge is power. Is there something that we're drawing on in this sort of species type drawings as well? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I'm also thinking of, in a sense, sort of musicizing them to uh, either um, suggest a kind of species that perhaps existed in the past or a kind of proposition for an imagined future where they may come together. And, and like I said, they would show us how to cohabit this planet. Mm. <laughs> when when it's it's a moment to turn to another species other than the human race mm. and the text on here is this your sort of story writing your narrative playing out uh well i mean i i do draw from um there is of course this the element of the fictional that i really deeply enjoy i mean speaking of again storytelling i think no two stories are the same i mean it's really the teller who weaves their own uh, perceptions their own ideas views interpretations of things and um, i mean that's something that i've really been preoccupied with through a lot of my practice and um, especially here like you said i mean the whole act of documenting archiving this production of knowledge that was so integral to the colonial practice of uh, studying species from the lands that they visited so it is culling imagery out of existing um, um, uh, and archives that mm. i have been going to um, but forming their own sort of world of an imagined, imagined mm. species of fantastical species that might perhaps come together. And, and also in that vein, and this is something that I kind of wanted to expand on a bit, is that there were also many species introduced to India at that time, which have caused a huge number of like, problems. Like they've become deeply invasive species which have killed a lot of the natural habitat you see it around bangalore around the lines i know your leaking lines work looked at various lines that were drawn up could you say something about that as well when nature isn't benign which i think we sometimes forget that it isn't <laughs> oh yeah i mean you do see the erasure of a lot of species because of the sort of disturbance in the ecological sort of, uh, I mean, these are native to that particular land and certainly injecting something that's extraneous or foreign can uh, affect the ecological balance there. And uh, as you rightly point out, but I think, I mean, for me as an artist, the line is such an essential part of an artist's toolkit and when drawn across territory uh, has such huge implications for people on either side and often uh, when i think of these these lines or these divisions it's not so much the physical border as much as the sort of social and psychological barriers that exist between people between communities and i think also, as we go along, I probably speak of other works where, um, where I often think of these overlaps also between ecology and cultures where they come together and mm. these liminal spaces or spaces that are shared and rich in biodiversity are also often uh, you know, spaces that I'm trying to think of where communities come together and um, have a cultural experience that yeah. is rich. Can we look at um, the amazing chorus work, which if we, I think if there were, um, if created, yeah, that, that's, that's the one. If there <laughs> were an image for storytelling and receiving stories, I think this could possibly be it. Um, because we're seeing someone in the middle. And can you tell us a bit about how this installation, it's sort of part of a series yeah, I mean, this was actually, uh, you know, at a time when I was really um, going through a lot of war zones and, and you know, sort of, I don't know if you, how familiar with the Leaking Line series that actually mm. had um, 
not just beginning with my own experience of the Radcliffe line that was, uh, you know, drawn between uh, a little village that uh, the Vaga Atari border, which actually uh, runs through a little village and, and what it did in terms of tearing apart a nation into two. And uh, when I think of lines drawn elsewhere, when I began seeing the Duran line between say Afghanistan, Pakistan, or say the, you know, you have several other lines, the blue line, the green line and so on. And, and uh, while looking at a lot of these zones, I was thinking of these uh, pre-radar acoustic devices that were built during the world wars. And uh, it was really to track sounds of enemy aircrafts. And um, I decided to subvert those notions of war by having sounds of birds uh, in communication across borders. So you have like say the cuckoo bird from um, Israel singing to the Palestinian sunbird or you have again the crested caracara from Mexico calling out to the eagle from the US or um, I mean peacock with the chukar or the peacar. So all of these are again coin names but I have a whole range of and the sounds that I began to source from the Manchester Museum archives that uh, you know helped me source these sounds. So it was also to try and tune into signals from the natural world that we are often uh, not being attentive enough. It's almost like if we were to listen to nature and yeah. Know. Yeah. And, and also when you think about archives and I think about you doing your archival work, that is something that there's such a paucity of is sound recording. Like sound archives are a real rarity. Um, and it's only sort of, you know, maybe since, sound was easily recordable that you have it but you don't have it in the same way that you have this paper trail the bureaucratic paper trail which you pointed on like there is does that not miss the psychological and all the things you're really filling in for us yeah i mean speaking of the bureaucratical and you know we we spoke about that i mean there was nearly a decade and a half of work that i made mm. using the rubber stamp, which is of course such a metaphor of the you know, bureaucracy. And anyone who knows India would know that almost nothing uh, is, is, you know, can either come in or leave without that rubber stamp that is um, so sort of deeply entrenched in bureaucracy. And I think that that was um, something that is also a very um, seminal part of my work where I draw out of official records, whether they were names of people who've gone missing in various regions or out of official police records or monuments that have either been, that have either disappeared or mm. due to pulls and pressures of rapid urbanization, builder lobby, land grabbing, efforts at conservation, preservation have been lost. So a lot of um, those people who are on the margins or, you know, people who are, uh, who don't have the official status as citizens um, and and those identities that are not recognized or stamped and endorsed by the state um, are sort of fall within those crevices and cracks um, which is something that runs again through a lot of the work and how does one bring forth these stories that are often silent or, or, or unseen and and if we think about if we yeah go that we're gonna see yeah Jen thank you so much um, <laughs> a few other you knew exactly oh, where yeah. I was going <laughs> a few other sort of of these they're just totally wonderful these works and um when things are back to normal they should be coming to London and and elsewhere um are these works and your practice at large, is it very much embedded in India and South Asia or do you think you'd be making similar work if you were elsewhere? I think, I mean, certainly the place you live and work shapes the way you think. And uh, I wouldn't say that 
my practice would be the same. Certainly yeah. not. I mean, I think the impulses, the motivations, what drives you as an artist is so deeply rooted in, at least I can speak for myself, that it's so deeply rooted from in my own experience of, of uh, not just my growing up years in, in India and um, while I, I might take that vantage point outside of India and of course the work really then expands into uh, the universal, yeah. you know, what's so personal can also be the, the more universal and I've seen that through my practice where a piece that is so deeply personal uh, was received across the world with I think that resonance that it carried, which I really never imagined. And I made it with a lot of hesitation. This is a work I made in 2007, which had to do with my own relationship with my mother, who I lost very early as a little girl. And I grew up with all the things she left behind, amongst which were her saris and that remained stacked for nearly 30 years. But I brought them out at some point and I decided to make translations from her handwritten recipe books into Braille. Hmm. I sort of, you know, uh, wanted the viewer to face the kind of inaccessibility to the text, much like my own relationship with her. And I often think of language as being something that is so limiting when it comes to expressing or communicating deep notions of loss. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So it also links with the, the work that's just been opened um in paris which you've also used braille in this work that's right it's so it's such a beautiful work and it's a number of constitutions from different countries but certain do you want to, to tell us which bits are in braille so uh, i mean these are uh, I'm, I'm glad you brought this up because the work that I was talking about was really a decade before this work and mm -hmm. uh, some of these, you know, like I said, uh, the ideas remain the same, they sort of transform and um, I mean in this case it's called verso recto recto verso and um, you have constitutions again beginning with in the Indian and the Pakistani constitution. So. I began looking at this document in way back in 2002-2003 when uh, there was what we are experiencing globally today was what we were seeing in the city of Mumbai where a lot of migrants who were coming in were being excluded and, and you know you there was this sort of resistance towards outsiders and some of the same anxieties you see globally today and uh, I started revisiting this sort of promise of democracy and what were the values that it stood for and uh, decided to uh, work with the constitutions but in this case it sort of really expands not just India, Pakistan but it has US, Cuba, Serbia, Croatia, Sudan, South Sudan, North and South Korea, there's uh, China and Japan and so on. So essentially what you see are the constitutions made in the dotted form, but where all the common shared values of say liberty, equality, justice mm. are in Braille. It's almost a sort of metaphor of having lost sight of our uh, shared and common aspirations, mm. our common dreams and values that are so, uh, yeah. And as with the, the double bind being that as an artwork, the braille is, you can't touch it. So that's also yeah. like, does not communicate to anyone. It's totally redundant. That's right. Yeah. I mean, with the man, you can neither feel it nor, nor can the sighted view it, nor can those who are not sighted. So it's this kind of the illegibility is also about the sort of half truths and and our own uh, limitations or perceptual limitations in the way we view the world. I think while we are free to make certain choices, I think there's no escaping the fact that we we're all um, you know we have our preconceived notions, and I think the work is also a reflection on our own. Um, 
our own uh, limitations of understanding other perspectives and other views and holding on to our side of the story and the sort of space in between the separation of the two scrolls. It's also kind of alludes to these rivers. And again, the sort of this, I've made this with um, craftspeople who work in Kutch in Gujarat. And what's also interesting is that this is a dying craft, uh, which almost only exists between Kutch and Karachi, both border sharing uh, places between India and Pakistan. And that sort of adds another layer of meaning to the work. Um, Rina, would you say, and, you know, at a time we talked earlier, like where politics is seemingly thriving on terms of difference, um, would you say, and, and especially so in India, where enormous pressure is being put on Muslim communities and also the arts community in terms of what censorship and what you can, can't say, would you say you're an optimist? I'd like to think that um, each of us have the capacity to make a difference and that we can bring about change if we were to collectively work towards, you know, making the change happen. And I think art is definitely a great vehicle, uh, whether it has its own reach, uh, perhaps a not very wide reach, but I think, you know, films or there's so many other forms of art that reach out to a whole range of people. And, and I, I certainly am one who um, believes that, um, that there is, it is uh, incumbent upon us to really think of through our work, the social political change that we can bring about. And, yeah. uh, and to question our own realities. Yeah. It's, it's, um, no, I, I just, I, I think about it in terms of the environment that you're operating in as well, which I know many this year and many photographers have sort of been very heavily censored. Do you worry about it in terms of the art community? Because I think artists feel that then they're, they're not as scrutinized. It's true. I mean, we're sort of still under the radar. And, mm -hmm. But I think as a community, there is a collective strength and there is um, a lot more conversation between us. But I think, unfortunately, we are in our, we all live in our own echo chambers. Mm. Often we carry our own confirmation biases. We're all um, holding on to, like I said, our own partial truths. But what is really needed is the sort of fluidity of being able to move between both sides and being able to appreciate both perspectives. And, and I think what's happening is that we are, as a you know, as a society getting more and more polarized and you see democracies all over the world are under strain. And um, so I think there is, there is a need more than ever before to be able to um, be more fluid and, and more sort of open-minded as far as uh, being able to absorb and, and accept other other perspectives. Mm. And I mm. think much of those gaps uh, between what is said, I mean, and I think of, again, when we speak of stories and you think of memory and memory of the past and, you know, what do we carry? I mean, memory is such a complex set of interactions between seeing, remembering, imagining some shape by language, some mm. by imagery. And, and often much of um, our sort of the things that we disagree are about what happened in the past that is being replayed. And I think that is uh, something that we, um, whether we're trying to um, take recourse to history or we, we don't seem to be learning from the mistakes. Yes. Of 
past. I mean, we keep going back to making the same mistakes over and over again. But uh, yeah, and here again with this sort of invisible hand that is at play, sort of trying to rearrange the natural world, you know, through shifting ecotones. And like I was yeah. saying, uh, ecotones is really that space between two biomes, which is really, and this, this, this is from the River Nile, or even drawings that I was making of, of the River Nile. And one was of the Tista River between Bangladesh or the Colorado River. Um, and these, so just to explain to everyone, these are rivers which are sources of conflict. Again, we see these sort of water bodies being sort of an area of dispute. That's right. And honed in on as the place, and understandably so, because they are such an invaluable resource. Um, but tell us a bit more about these works, and in particular the drawings, where you've got, you've sort of rearranged them, almost like one of those cube, these puzzle cubes that you would get, where all the tiles you rearrange. Um, can you talk to us a bit about that aesthetic that you've adopted? I, I often think of the unit in the whole, of the sort of missing fragment, and how, like I said, of how we sort of, um, you know, the sort of gaps in transmission between um, between what is said and how it gets interpreted. And uh, here, literally, you have a missing fragment or even through, you know, like I said, the metaphor of blindness of having lost yeah. sight or other works like blind spots where it is a physiological blind spot of what the eye is viewing at a time and this sort of vision that it cannot, um, you know, and you sort of have to complete the gaps through your own interpretation. And um, yeah, I play with that. It's a visual play with the sort of missing component yeah. that we all seem to be, uh, you know, carrying with us. And, and can you just find, before we open to questions, is the, the text, you, you often do this with your work and it's something that I really enjoy because I, adore reading um particularly but the text you often give us a, a, a snippet of text but it's also often obscured uh that's interesting actually when i started writing i just felt that it became like an information channel and i didn't really mean it to be that and it's also again about what do these histories that again sort of reviewing the factual and the fictional and and to me it was almost like it was also irrelevant in a way that what belongs to which side i mean it really doesn't belong to either i mean mm -hmm. um you know rivers are free to flow uh disrespecting artificial man-made boundaries of, you know or, or divisions and and so i mean i i think for me, it was also like trying to efface that, um, the sort of fixed, uh, the sort of thinking of porosity of borders. And, mm -hmm. and I decided to strike out the text uh, where it's there and yet it's, it's sort of negated or not essential and, and uh, something that you can go against because uh, here are two countries battling over natural resources or, or, or the natural forms that, yeah, that don't belong to them. So I kind of negate that. Mm. By and these, and, but and in these works, it's really where I started to extract the line of each of these. Yeah. So what you see here are actually like the borders between say US and Mexico where the mm. Colorado River dispute or the river engine between North and South Korea or the Shat al Arab between Iraq and Iran and Sudan, South Sudan with Nile. So each of these lines were then brought into play in the in the later work that you see, which actually this is a preview. Yeah, <laughs> I was to say no one I know these are I shouldn't say these are like this is sort of hot off the studio desk or floor or I don't know where you make your work but um that they're going to be shown on Saturday 
for Nature Mort, their show. And these, they're so beautiful. And I think actually what's great about them for the online platform is that you still get the sense of the materials that you've knitted through the paper. Um, and again, it's electrical wires, isn't it, that you're working with? That's right, yes. I mean, uh, I think it's this idea of how these sort of divisions come together and dissolve in a sense, you know. I mean, it's still so new, the work to me. I'm trying to make sense of it, but it's just sort of recomposing or reorganizing and reordering these lines to form a kind of landscape in a sense of, so all of these, like I said, these lines of division kind of dissolve uh, to form, open up a new, uh, the sort of fluidity of the river. And, mm -hmm. and I um, presume actually these lines, I mean, these rivers change as well, don't they? Like this will be irrelevant. I mean, these not the, won't be the exact river that we see in five to 10 years. Absolutely. I mean, these are river drawings and then I, you know, there's another body of work which I would urge you all to see <laughs> as uh, that is released. It's actually, it's the, the new exhibition is called Deep Rivers Run Quiet. <laughs> That's so beautiful. Mm. And again, it has to do with these sort of, I think, of these long histories that are so much more deep, deeply rooted and um, that all of these sort of surfacial uh, tensions and ripples and um, um, disturbances are kind of irrelevant in a sense. Yeah. I want to first of all start by just saying thank you to both of you so much and for everyone to bearing with me while I go through the slides. <laughs> it's um, usually, I, I, it's been a real journey if we're speaking about journeys and going through a flow of things, um, discovering you know, your, your work in this oscillatory manner, um, which leads us all the way over here. Um, I wanted to just pick up on a couple of things that really resonated while you know, I took a step back and learned so much from the both of you. But there was one thing that really resonated with me, Rena, where you're talking about communication and how sometimes words don't express everything. Actually, very often they do not express everything. And that is precisely the premise of this current show where if you actually even look scientifically at the role words play in communication, it adds up to seven to 10% of what we actually mean. The rest is tone, gesture, form, um, context. And you know, that is where the power of image comes in, in the telling of stories. And beyond that, in communicating between, um, between people and peoples. Um, and running off that, uh, we're talking, we're, we're briefly going on this tangent, which would have been such an interesting conversation in itself. But it was, you know, the value of art and artists and in the communication around the world. And for me, you know, as a curator, I've always said that art is one of the most empathetic yet critical mediums by which you can communicate about topics. And here you're touching on some pretty important and heavy hitting topics. You know, the dispute between different countries, the tensions between humans and nature, humans and animals. Um, and Shooting a question back to you, I was wondering whether you could expand a little bit on memory and the memories that you want maybe each of us to have when we're looking at your work, or if it's really just up to us to develop our own memories, right? And in a sense, develop our own stories when we look at your work. Like, for example, you look at these river drawings, and I won't necessarily get that it's a river, but it might spark this idea of flow with regards to something else. So I guess, I, long story short, <laughs> um, 
the role of memory in your work and how we each approach it? I think that's, that's a key question. I mean, I think as an artist, I really enjoy the fact that, you know, when you make work, uh, it's not about imposing your, the artist's intention, I think, is one aspect of it. I mean, I often think of myself purely as a catalyst because I think that so much around us uh, sort of uh, runs through us as ideas that then emerge. I mean, I think of the movement of people across places like never before. I mean, when you speak of communication, at no other moment of human history have we had such a closely, you know, communication being so easy. I mean, you have uh, cables running underwater <laughs> that really connect us as, you know, the, op the fiber optic cables that connect the world today. And yet uh, we still seem to be uh, living in a world where these communication lines seem to fail us because we don't seem to understand each other and um and memory of course is is something that you know we really each of us hold on to i was speaking of how each of us have our own versions of the same narrative or or the same experience where no two people really see anything alike and why would I uh, subject my art through something where I impose my own, um, you know, my own story necessarily? I, I just feel that a lot of people can really enrich it through their own, uh, through what they bring. And in fact, that's something that has happened uh, several times in my own work and that has really, um, sort of given me new directions in my own practice. When, uh, you know, when I took a, a sculpture to Korea, for instance, uh, for a project that uh, I was doing outdoors and it was to do with salt. I mean, actually it was not to do with salt. It was to be made. It was a sculpture in the natural environment and a text that was to be grown um, in the ground. Uh, but due to some change of weather, we had to move the sculpture in. And what was interesting is that the sculpture itself was to carry this text on the ground that said, was a quotation from Marcel Proust that said, a change of weather is sufficient to recreate the world and ourselves. And I, uh, when it got moved in, I just felt that it completely lost meaning because it was downscaled and its own relationship with the natural environment was gone. So I did want to take some element out into nature. And I decided to make the text in salt, salt as an essential component again of something that, uh, you know, of um, also one that extends life as a, as a medium anyhow. So I took, took salt, the, the text out at various places and, people sort of could walk over it and the salt would dissipate. But to me, I was constantly thinking about what it would mean to them in Korea because of all the connotations of salt and Buddhist uh, practice and to ward off evil or in, you know, in Christianity for purity, permanence and so on. And uh, when I went there, they constantly thought of me having come from India and my relationship to salt as Gandhi's uh, usage of salt to literally bring down an empire, the pinch of salt. And I found that so interesting and it really changed the way I thought about these salt texts that I then began to take back to the sea as salt having come from the sea and a kind of return to the sea. So yeah, I mean, I, just one of the examples of how uh, others can really enrich the work and um, and yeah, I don't necessarily think that I would want people to only carry uh, the artist's intention as being uh, the final way that the work should be viewed. Yeah, it's incredible how many other triggers and thoughts, you know, it can, it can open. And, you know, I'm, I'm so intrigued by, you know, what people have even been thinking over the course of this exchange, right? Because, 
there is you know yourself who's speaking over from india but we've got people from the us switzerland the uk um not to mention also colombia on this call so you know there's there, there's there, there's quite a range <laughs> um and yeah i think it's it's beautiful and i just want to just really 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 thank you um for your for your time this evening and i know for you it's very late at night so you know thank you so much <laughs> um that's one of the other things you know despite increased communication and all of us being able to be here via zoom um you know it doesn't detach from the fact that we all have different time zones and different parts of the world you know to adhere to right so there's um, nationalities and temporalities and temporalities <laughs> and um everything everything is an exchange and a learning process um, but also I want to thank everyone for joining us um, this evening and you know our our door or our inbox is always open so don't hesitate to message us and be in touch um, and you know a massive thank you you know Rena and Cleo um, for you know the incredible energy between you two and you know the beautiful discussions that you're creating I think that you know I started off <laughs> this session by saying like what an incredibly heavy day today is <laughs> like it's a really heavy day <laughs> um but i think moments like this i mean at least for me personally nurture my soul so um thank you mm. thank you both and i we, you know if i were in paris i would be the first to go see, see your music Gime show i you know so excited about that and you know all the best for the launch of um, your online show with nature mark on saturday we are all sending you warmth and excitement. Mm. Thank you. And that's just to, to hone in, that will just be on their website, won't it? Yes. The show, right. so anyone, anywhere can access it. Okay. And I would <laughs> urge you to. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rina. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Jenny. It was amazing. Thank you. Bye. Bye.